Mush, I'll need you more than ever. One, two, three. Shh. All right, we're going to start. Uh, as you know, we, uh, <coughs> we have an informal agreement without much choice dealing with uh, Skinny Sheehan's uh, operation, the Special Olympics, which we love to do. And Skinny always speaks here, but Skinny, unfortunately, has been detained uh, 1,400 miles away in a very warm climate. But he's with us in spirit. So taking his place and doing a far better job is Jen Kramer, who will speak about the upcoming Polar Pledge. Jen, get up here. I say a far less skinnier version of Skinny, but he is uh, enjoying his time away. So real quickly, wanted to say hello and thanks to everyone who's here. What a beautiful room. I'm assuming those cameras in the back are not for me, so that's a good thing. Uh, I would love to invite all of you to join Special Olympics Chicago as we honor Justice Ann Burke this Thursday, uh, an event put on by Chicago's legal community uh, celebrating Chicago as the birthplace of Special Olympics. That's at Carnival uh, from 6 to 9. You're certainly welcome to uh, attend and buy tickets at the door or on the SOChicago.org website. And lastly, as Dr. Paul Green has said, it is polar plunge season, and there's a hundred faces in here who have plunged. We're looking at Commissioner Fritchie, Commissioner Gaynor, um, hoping for Cook County President Tony Preckwinkle. As you know, uh, uh, we, we certainly have Dr. Paul Green, three-time plunger. This will be my third. This will be, he's on Team Skinny Sheehan. You're all welcome to join in and plunge this year. If not, please and thank you for your support in advance. Come out, it's the original Sunday Fun Day. Um, and we hope to see you there Sunday, March 6th. And again, uh, always grateful and forever for our partnership with City Club, for Jay Doherty, and for all of your support throughout the years. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Where's Jack? Ah, young Jack Thornton there. If you have your business card, put it in the official fishbowl for the very, very exclusive drawing at the end for... Very big prizes, and it's totally fair. <laughs> totally, not fair, totally fair. Uh, a quick reminder that we have a couple of events coming up this week. We have Andrea Zopp will be speaking here on Wednesday, candidate for U.S. Senate, and on Thursday, Ellen Alberting from the uh, Joyce Foundation, and that, of course, is sold out uh, completely. I don't know about Ms. Zopp. I think there are a few seats left. Uh, we have Shakespeare coming up. Many of you are fans. And I want to, uh, two more things, and then we'll move it along. On the 5th of February, we have Senator Durbin. And on uh, February 8th, uh, after the Iowa caucus, uh, David Axelrod, Matt Strawn, and David Yepsen, who used to be the editor of the Des Moines Register and knows everything about Iowa, even though he's now in Carbondale, but nevertheless, he knows everything about what's happening in Iowa. They'll be here to analyze the returns. That one is sold out. But as you know, some events sell out more than others, like today. So uh, without further ado from me, ladies and gentlemen, the president of this organization, the one and only Jay Doherty. Thank you, Paul. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Father Dennis Holtschneider for that fabulous invocation, our board of directors, Chairman Paul Green, Jackie Robinson Ivey, uh, Martha Janto, Miles Berman. Let's give them all a round of applause. <clears throat> uh, two acknowledgments before we get to the elected officials. First of all, uh, the president of Loyola is here. And the president of Loyola and I went to college together a few years back. He was the smartest guy in the class, he really was. And he was the nicest guy, and he's here today, John Pellicero. John, where are you? Where is he? There we go, John. Thank you very much. Also, you really can't run an organization like this without having great corporate support. And in the years that I've been president, uh, uh, no one has helped more than Commonwealth Edison. And the president is here, Ann Promissori. And thank you very much. And, and Jen Kramer, thank you for all you do for the Special Olympics. At the City Club, we try to uh, encourage everyone to give back in some civic or charitable way. So we have a bunch of elected officials here, but here's the one ground rule. 
No senators can acknowledge themselves because someone else is going to acknowledge themselves. So we're going to start with the Cook County Board President. And if she's here, she can stand, say her name. <laughs> Tony Preckwinkle, Cook County Board President. There we go. Okay, thank you. Joe, let's keep going. There we go, thank you. All right, elected officials on this wall here, the south wall. Any, no senators? Okay, how? Oh, geez, okay, he just, all right, yeah. Mr. President, he wasn't listening. He wasn't following our rules. It's almost like being in the General Assembly. Go ahead. Go ahead. Welcome, there we go. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you very much. There we go, 44th Ward. There we go, welcome, okay. Thank you. Any Fidel, anybody else in this row here? Go ahead. Oh, there we go. Man, I don't know how you hold this caucus together, John. Go ahead. Okay, Mike, thank you very much, Mike. All right, Miles Berman, your role here. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. There we go, welcome, thank you. Anybody in the, down the middle? Okay, how about this row, right here where Pat Magoon is, this row. Thank you very much, Christian. All right, Mark Donovan, your row. Anybody in there? All right, we got all the elections? Okay, all right. Thank you. If you've got questions, write them out, and uh, why don't you get them up? It's a Miles Berman. Miles, why don't you stand up? Let them see you. Get your pictures, Miles Berman, get your questions. Okay. Our guest speaker today is president of the Illinois Senate. As he does each year, he honors us again today by delivering his State of the State address at the City Club of Chicago. Our next speaker provides over the largest Senate caucus in America and the largest Senate Democratic caucus in the history of Illinois. He is a graduate of Loyola University and Loyola University Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Illinois Senate, John Cullerton. <laughs> Mr. President. All right, John. Thank you very much, Jay. First thing I'd like to do is introduce and reintroduce <laughs> members of the largest Senate caucus, Republican or Democrat, in the United States. So my colleagues, if I, as I call your name out, please, uh, please stand. Uh, no particular uh, order of importance, except for the fact that I'd like to tell you that I'm endorsing this man who's running for the U.S. Senate, State Senator Napoleon Harris. Napoleon. <laughs> State Senator John Mulrow from the northwest side of Chicago. John. There's a guy who's got a primary, so he's a little anxious, so he introduced himself already. State Senator Mike Hastings. There's another senator who's got a primary. She's a little anxious. She stood up. Her name is State Senator Patricia Van Pelt. One of our leaders, Terry Link, Senator Terry Link. From Lake County, Senator Belinda Bush. All the way from Central Illinois, who used to be my chief of staff, now he's a great senator from Central Illinois, Andy Menar. Andy Menar is here. <laughs> State Senator Daniel Biss is here. Daniel. <laughs> Another one of our leaders, Maddie Hunter. Maddie, there you are. <laughs> the State Senator in the district right next to mine, Heather Staines. Heather Staines is here, right? Oh, Heather, where are you? 
I hope I pronounce her name correctly. This is a state senator. Her name is Iris Martinez. The guy who's second in seniority in the Senate, Donnie Trotter. Senator Donnie Trotter. Another leader, a leader in education, um, Senator Lightford. Kimberly Lightford's here. And also, State Senator Julie Morrison's here. Julie? Now, by the way, all of those senators voted for me for President of the Senate. I'd like to introduce a senator who didn't vote for me. <laughs> senator Michael Connolly from uh, Naperville. Uh, we're joined by another special person today. Uh, I might be the president of the Senate, but I'm honored to have in attendance the speaker of my house, my wife, Pam Cullerton. Yeah. So it's been seven years since I stood here as the new Senate president, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished. We removed a corrupt governor from office. We abolished the death penalty. We officially recognized marriage equality. We reformed pensions for new hires. We kept conventions uh, coming to McCormick Place, and we controlled Medicaid spending. Presented with problems, we've risen to the task to make Illinois a better state that recognizes everyone's rights and provides pathways to excellence. But there's more to do. There's an injustice we've tolerated too long, one that crushes dreams, stifles growth, and keeps us as a state from moving forward. It is Illinois' system of funding public schools, a system that shackles poor communities to poor expectations while rewarding the affluent even with even greater resources. It can be tolerated no longer. At a time when we seem to label every problem a crisis, let me be clear. Our broken school funding formula is the defining crisis of our time. Fixing it is the turnaround our state truly needs. Today, I'll show you what's wrong with the system, point to states that appear to do it right, and outline ways to make education better and more equitable here. Our students, parents, teachers, and taxpayers are tired of the bickering, tired of the impasse. They're looking for leaders with the courage to step beyond the status quo and to do what's right. Today, I'm asking my colleagues to take that step. Our problems are not a secret. For nearly 20 years, the system has festered in broad daylight. Every morning across Illinois, school children learn, teachers teach, and principals lead. But the doors of opportunity do not open as wide for students in some schools as in others, even as our expectations and demands rise equally across all schools. In Berwyn, a kindergartner bundles up for class because his aging school can drop below 40 degrees even with the heat on. And he wonders if his favorite books will get ruined like the last time the pipes burst and flooded the school library. In Sandoval, a town about 100 miles south of Springfield, third graders head to school where dwindling resources mean no art classes or foreign language programs. There's no school librarian to help find books or school social worker to offer support. And in East Aurora, the school's social workers serve 900 students each. More than half of East Aurora's 1,100 incoming freshmen read below grade level. The task of improving scores falls to just two reading specialists. These situations have nothing to do with the capacity of our kids or the caliber of our educators, and everything to do with how we fund our public schools. Our state has the most inequitable system of school finance in the country. Let me repeat that. Our state has the most inequitable system of school finance in the country. We give less to the students who need more and cover barely a third of the total cost of public education when most states cover half. Let me put it this way. If the National Football League 
operated like our school funding system, the Super Bowl champ would be guaranteed the top draft pick. It's fundamentally unfair. I believe that our students, all of them, deserve better. Providing it, however, will not be easy. There's a reason why the current school funding formula has been in place for two decades. It's hard to change an entrenched status quo. It requires true, dedicated leadership. The question is whether today's leaders are up to the task. Nearly 20 years ago, Governor Jim Edgar staked his legacy on correcting this wrong. He came within a single vote of delivering a complete overhaul of school funding. But at the end of the day, one of the most popular governors in Illinois history was stymied by selfish regional politics within his own party. No governor since, not Ryan Blagojevich nor Quinn, even bothered to try. So I'm here to issue a challenge to Governor Rauner. Since he wants to turn around Illinois, there's no better place to start than the state system for funding public schools. There is no worse status quo. Shouldn't all of our children have access to equal opportunities regardless of zip code or tax bracket? Shouldn't our system prioritize getting rid of hurdles that prevent children from getting a quality education? The world has changed over the past 20 years. Shouldn't our school funding system change with it? Look around. This room is filled with successful people. Is there anyone here who doesn't owe his or her success to education? The strength of our public schools is vital for the civic, economic, and social strength of our state. Unfortunately, our state's not doing so well. The performance gap that divides our rich and poor students, as well as our students of color, ranks among the worst in the nation. You begin to see it in lagging fourth grade reading scores among low-income students. From there, those students increasingly fall behind their peers at schools with greater resources. Nationally, we rank a dismal 42nd in terms of the performance gap in reading scores among these students. Our state falls among the bottom 10 when it comes to the achievement gap between black and white students. And while we suffer the status quo, other states are moving the needle further and faster than we are. We know that students in disadvantaged communities are just as capable of achieving educational excellence as those from the best neighborhoods. We just need to invest a little more to make up the difference. And the earlier we do it, the better. Just about everyone else gets this. Look at Ohio. Ohio is the polar opposite of what we're doing for schools here. Ohio invests heavily in lower income students and schools because officials there understand the investment pays off. The higher the level of education, the lower the reliance on government social programs, the lower the unemployment rate, the higher the wages, and the more attractive your schools, communities, and states become. But it's not just Ohio. Every state does it better than us. For every dollar Ohio spends on students, $1.22 is invested in low-income students. On the flip side, for every dollar Illinois spends educating students, only 81 cents goes towards low-income students. I think it's time to turn that around. Remember, Governor Rauner vetoed all of our budget proposals except for one. He signed the public, edu the public education budget. And he described it as his greatest accomplishment, even though not a single Republican lawmaker voted for it. He champions what he calls world record spending for Illinois schools. But we have to ask ourselves two questions. How much are we going to spend on education? And how are we going to spend it? If the money isn't going to help students in need, it doesn't really matter how much we spend. That's why our funding formula needs to be overhauled. The current system tends to exacerbate rather than alleviate problems. That's how we can spend record amounts on schools and still rank among the lowest in the nation in terms of the state support for education funding. It results in some schools building up reserves large enough to cover years' worth of spending, while others could barely last the week. So how do we create a new funding formula to better serve today's kids? The new approach should reflect some key principles. 
State resources should go to school districts based on the needs of their students with more funds to support kids who we know from research and our own common sense need extra support. We're talking about kids who live in poverty, have special learning needs, or who are just learning the English language. The challenges confronting East St. Louis, where 99% of kids are poor, are different than in Lake Forest, where less than 4% of kids are low income. Let's create a school funding formula that acknowledges that. Funds should be distributed through a single, straightforward model. Special deals are over. This will be welcome relief for districts that confront one bureaucratic hurdle after another. We need to take into account a school district's ability to support local schools with local funds, and accountability needs to follow these dollars. So guided by these key principles, a new school funding formula would level the playing field that has gotten so off kilter. Now clearly, no one wants any school district to lose money. We all understand that dollars for schools are dollars for students. But let's acknowledge that while there may be some concerns about winners and losers in a new system, there are winners and far too many losers in the current system. We cannot continue to dither while some districts are funded at double and triple the state average, while others have to convert maintenance closets into art rooms and cut world language and technology. Why should a high schooler in Elgin get a $12,000 a year education, while 30 miles away, a high schooler in Niles gets a $22,000 a year public education, even, by the way, as Elgin taxes itself 22% higher than the state average? It's not lost on me that we are sitting in Chicago as I speak about an Illinois school funding fix. You might wonder what all this could mean for the public schools in Chicago. Chicago needs help, quickly. That much is clear. The school funding formula we are proposing could help, not resolve, but help some of the financial challenges for Chicago. And here's how. First, a single school funding formula that recognizes the needs of low-income students would benefit Chicago just as it would benefit Berwyn or Cairo or East St. Louis, all of which would have a student poverty rate at nearly 90% or higher. Districts with the same level of need would be treated the same. Again, any special deals are gone. Second, the Chicago Public School District is the only district in Illinois that pays almost all of its own pension costs. That takes local dollars out of local classrooms. This year, Illinois is spending $2,266 per student on pensions in school districts outside Chicago. In Chicago, the state spends $31 per student. Local taxpayers pick up the rest. So it's time to treat the public schools in Chicago like every other school district in Illinois. Pension parity must be part of the new formula. And speaking of Chicago, remember that world record education budget the governor signed? It increased school spending by $265 million statewide. I was recently in central Illinois, and I asked a group how much of that extra money they thought went to Chicago. And they said, all of it went to Chicago. And then I went back here in my own district, and I asked the same question. The response was, well, whatever it was, it wasn't enough. Do you want to know how much more Chicago schools got out of that extra $265 million? Minus $60 million. Under the school aid formula, we increased the appropriation by $265 million. Chicago's total take went down by $60 million. Does anyone here think that improves education for Chicago students? That's the problem with the current formula. The dollars aren't going where we know they are needed. And we know Chicago kids, by the way, can perform as well as any. According to a recent US Department of Education national report card, Chicago students improved in math and reading faster than other urban schools and the nation at large. That's great. So why is there a sense of surprise? Is it because we all know that too many of those kids in Chicago face nearly impossible odds? and often lack the basic resources needed to attain educational success? 
okay, then shouldn't we do something about it? Chicago students are our students. We have the same responsibility to them that we have to every public school student in Illinois. We cannot applaud their accomplishments and then turn our back on their shortcomings. Their turnaround agenda is our turnaround agenda and needs to be Illinois' top priority. I hope you will join me in making that happen. Thank you once again for the opportunity for me to speak to you. I'm not going to take any questions. So, I have uh, my notes here of the senators that are here, and I have next to Senator Don Harmon, President Pro Tem. He is here. Senator Don Harmon, the, the President Pro Tem, is here. That's what I get and try to put a title next to him. The next vote, you may have two. Uh, Crowd's a little tough today. Okay, here we go. With Mr. Dr. Lustig, with so many social service agencies on the brink of closing, can anything be done to assist the state's most vulnerable? Let's try and have questions about education. Okay, this is okay. Go ahead. Well, obviously, there's a question about our budget. So, real briefly, we passed the budget. The governor vetoed it except for the education funds. In the meantime, there's court orders, continuing appropriations, and 90% of our budget is being paid out. 10% is not. The big problem is that we're spending at the level that's about $6 billion more than we have coming in. The governor has not uh, agreed to uh, supporting the budget and making up the difference until we pass some of his turnaround agenda items, and that's been the nature of the problem. In the Senate, the senators here, the Democratic senators know we have a working supermajority, and we can override the governor. The House does not. So that's where the impasse is. And we continue to be willing to sit down and talk to the governor about his turnaround agenda, but we would ask him to understand that uh, it's not just the Democrats who are in charge of the budget in Illinois. He's the governor. He's in charge of it along with us, and we have to resolve it. It's been eight months without having a budget. And social service programs are suffering. <laughs> High school counselors are telling the seniors not to go to school in Illinois because we haven't funded our schools. We have a growing deficit. We have been downgraded. And that is not a business-friendly environment, in my opinion. So uh, that's the status. Uh, eager to hear what the governor's plans are uh, on Wednesday in describing the state, but it's in bad shape, and we want to change it. If you have questions, I know a lot of you who are elected officials probably don't, but the rest of you, uh, Jack, raise your hand. Jack, give me a question. There you go. Mr. President, this is from the barge guy, Ashen Ladd. Yesterday was National Commitment Day. What compliment day? Could be commitment, too. What compliment would you have given the governor had you seen him yesterday? <laughs> That's a city club question, by the way. Well, look, I, uh, I, it could be worse. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think our governor is open to working on our budget. He, I think the governor has indicated publicly and privately, certainly, that he's willing to be for, for, uh, comprom for compromises that involving revenue. Uh, and so when it comes to whenever we can resolve the issues that he, that he needs to be resolved on his turnaround agenda, when we come to solving the problems of our budget, I think he's going to be open to it. Uh, I believe that we will be able to come to some agreement on a, a constitutional pension reform. Uh, we do have a great state. You know, we have to remind ourselves with all this dysfunction in the government, we have a great state. We have a state that has folks who are highly educated. We make more money here in Illinois than all the states around us. I personally think that's a good thing. Some people think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, we have a great transportation system. Uh, we have great weather. 
Well, okay, I'm just kidding about that. So the fact is that uh, we're going to be, we're, we're, once we get past this, uh, this incredible hang-up that we didn't see coming, things are going to get better. And so in that regard, I think the governor is open-minded, and uh, I'd say he's got some, some, we would call them obsessions, that um, uh, we have to get over. Once we do that, uh, I think I'm going to be very positive, and we're going to bring things together. Question from Robinstein. Uh, uh, education is clearly a critical issue, but politically challenging. What are the odds fixing the formula in the midst of this broader political challenge? The governor has linked things together. We don't have a budget because he's got his turnaround agenda. So I can link things together, too. <laughs> this is a turnaround agenda. We've got to change the school funding formula. You guys <laughs> know how bad it is? So... Uh, and, and, you know, before we, before we appropriate money for education for next year, that starts July 1st, we have to fix this formula. And it's not a special deal for Chicago. In fact, we're eliminating the special deals for Chicago. Chicago has two special deals. They don't get any money for the pension system. That's a special deal. And they have a, a special block grant that we can, we can uh, eliminate as long as we have a new fair formula. So I'm making it a top priority. Uh, this is a bipartisan effort. There are many, many more school districts that in Republican state Senate districts that are losers under the current system than, than the opposite. So the, the majority of Republicans in the Senate, I don't know about Senator Connolly's district, but in others, there, there are some real, real uh, districts that are very similar, if not worse off, than Chicago. So we're talking about a, a formula that affects the entire state, uh, a, a uniform formula, and one that acknowledges the fact that we have not been focusing money on the great concentrations of poverty that we have. We're the worst in the nation at the formula, and we're one of the worst in providing support from the state. Those two together are just toxic. Hey, rather unique question form we have here, but we have two questions on health, and then we have one more on education, and then the moderator has a short question. This is from Juliet Burnham. Bernbaum, parent of three CPS kids. Oh, yeah. Thought you had a stake in this. Okay. <laughs> Couple of quick ones. How will a bill be brought? When will a bill be brought? How can we pressure lawmakers to support it? Pretty direct. Okay, so I know that uh, this question comes from one of my constituents. We have a great public school system in Chicago, in my district. I can only speak for my district, okay? We have great schools. And folks in our district are mobile. They can get up and leave. And when someone says the word bankruptcy, when it's so irresponsibly thrown out, I am offended. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that, okay? Uh, and so we are gonna fix Chicago's funding formula problems when we fix the entire state's formula. And I don't see why any school should be funded until all the schools are fairly funded. And that's my answer. You know, City Club rules, you're always allowed one mulligan. This is your mulligan. From Don Schollenberger, right in front. It seems the only answer to solving the state budget problem is for Governor Rauner to cave in to Speaker Madigan. Your thoughts? No, No, that's, that's, that's just not true. First of all, the Speaker and I are, are uh, similar, our caucuses are similar in terms of our positions. Uh, we're willing to negotiate with the governor. And uh, we would just characterize the governor's request as being uh, extreme or radical. Uh, he wasn't in government before. I'll just give you an example. He comes in and he want, one of his main things is to reform the, the workers' comp system. Well, he wasn't aware of the fact that we made major workers' comp changes four years ago. There's been a dramatic drop in workers' comp premiums. The workers' comp premiums, for example, are half of what they were 20 years ago and 19% lower than what they were four years ago. Well, he didn't know that, okay? And so, uh, he, but he, he ran on the pledge that he was going to fix workers' comp reform. So we're willing to talk to him about that topic, but we're not going to... Uh, up, upend the entire system. That's one example. The other is the governor thinks that the, apparently that the problem in Illinois is that the unions are too powerful 
and that as a result, you know, the teachers are just making too much money. That's what the problem is. So he wants to take away their right to negotiate. We're not going to do that. And so uh, when, we get to the, when we get to the point where, uh, when we get to the point where, where we just sit down and work through uh, the topic of collective bargaining, sure. The topic of workers' comp, sure. The speaker and I are, are organized in that regard. Now, I must say, the governor didn't spend a million dollars against me saying in statewide ads that I was a crook. So uh, that's a strange way to start your negotiations, you know, when, when you want to see if you can work out a deal. So maybe there's a little bit more animus there between the speaker and the governor. But I just want to sit down and work with them. I, everybody in my caucus and the Republicans know I like to work things out, and we're willing to do that. Uh, and it's getting to the point, though, where we can't go much longer without an agreement. So uh, let's, let's do it. You're not upset by that, are you? That, I love it. That he didn't spend a million dollars calling you a crook? <laughs> Very suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to say, you're not feeling cheated, right? No. Okay. okay. Now, we have two questions on health care, but they're both really good questions. Tim Egan, where are you? CEO of Rosen Hospital. Tim, they're right over there. Are Governor Ronner and his lawyers trying to reverse the Shriver Center's efforts to allow Medicaid funding to safety net hospitals? Well, talk about a tough question, all right? Um, Tim, is this, is this a, a consent decree? Yeah. Well, we've had, uh, in, over the years, we, the state's been sued, over the decades, the state's been sued in various areas of uh, human, human services, uh, uh, health care, and the state, in, instead of going to trial and losing, has centered into consent decrees. And as a result, we have to provide certain services. And that's a court order, and that's how even though we haven't appropriated money, the courts have ordered that we spend the money. And so recently, the governor has said he wants to re-examine those consent decrees. Now, he's the executive branch. He can go back into court. But he'd have to convince a judge, if we have this right, that that's going to be the case. Um, there's probably a lot of good reasons for those consent decrees, right? That's why, that's why there was a, an agreement. And so I don't see why we need to do that. I, I just don't see what the problem would be. I, I don't think these are areas of, of uh, it's not really the money. Uh, we, we would have the money to fund these programs because we've been doing it. Uh, and so I, I just think that uh, it's not a good idea. And I don't think we should support them on that. Okay? Next question is from, and pardon me on the, the last name, Salim al Nuruddin. Is that close? Close, close enough? We know you are. Okay. Me uh, member of the C Club, CEO Healthcare Consortium. Since 89% of the state budget has been approved, how much is 11% of the state budget that hasn't been? Well, the, the parts that haven't been approved are certain grants, uh, w certain programs that are dealing with human services that haven't been the subject of a court order or, or a consent decree, and the appropriations for higher ed. So all of the Appropriations for higher ed haven't been sent over. The reasons why the universities have been in, able to stay open so far is because they, they have a lot of their money they get from tuition. But they're running out of it. Some schools are much closer to being shut down than others, Chicago State being, being one of them, and as, as to in Eastern Illinois and Western. And as to the private schools, they get MAP grants. MAP grants, I think it's $360 million that we provide for the uh, universities. We haven't appropriated that money, and the universities have been basically uh, covering that, but that can't go on forever. So this is where we're coming to a head, and we have to uh, fairly soon, I would think, reach an agreement with the governor or uh, we're going to go further into the, into the hole. One question from the moderate who seldom gets involved in this, but <laughs> Ms. Breckwinkle, you know I that's not true, but I just say that to cover myself. <laughs> I've been involved in this a long time, the, the for formula. Uh, former State Senator Aldo DeAngelo had me do all kinds of research on it. And I said, we've got to get Einstein back from Princeton to try and figure it out. My question is, if we have a fair funding formula, will it be revenue neutral? Well, the formula right now is not revenue neutral. Chicago lost $60 million under the current formula. 
New Trier got an extra 60000 So uh, Lyons Township has $43 million in reserve. So every year, the formula changes because poverty rates change, attendance change, assess, uh, equalized assessed valuation changes. So there's no such thing as a revenue neutral formula. Now there are ways in which we can uh, take a formula and phase it in so that the implications are not as dramatic. I would tell you this, the amount of money that we're talking about shifting is about $400 million into the poorer school districts out of $8 billion. And so it can be done in a fair way. There's ways that you can do uh, hold harmless provisions so that it's phased in. And I'm more than happy to work in a bipartisan way with the Republicans in, in the Senate and the House, as well as the governor, to see if we can pass a bill. Thank you. The famous City Club mug, which you do have a... Hello.